I'm Tim McDonald. I'm the acting library director for the Pasadena Public Library. And this, as I said, is our 20th year. Um, One City, One Story began uh, 20 years ago, and the mission has stayed the same. We've designed this program in order to promote reading and literature in the community and also engage the community um, in a respectful and uh, tolerant conversation of, uh, about issues that may have different points of view and do that um, around one compelling book that we invite the entire community to read. And the book we're talking about today is a fantastic one. We're going to be talking about Stealing Home, Los Angeles, and uh, The Dodgers and the Lives Caught in Between by author Eric Nussbaum, who's joining us here today from Tacoma, Washington. Again, his first in-person appearance since the book was published in 2020, which is great to have him here. Um, Let's see. Let's first acknowledge a lot of the hard work that goes into creating a program like this. And there are lots of people that um, that joined together to form a really wonderful team to make this happen. First of all, our sponsors, uh, our founding sponsors who supported this program since the beginning, the Friends of the Pasadena Public Library. Thanks to them. And many of those members are here today. And our community sponsor this year, the Pasadena Literary Alliance and Festival of Women Authors. Thank you for their support this year, too. It's awesome. And I'd like to um, thank our hosts here today, the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Community Services here in the Robinson Recreation Center. And what a thrill to be presenting this program in a facility named for a very important family here in Pasadena, the Robinsons, that are so important to our, our history as a city and as a nation when it comes to um, when it comes to something we can be proud of. And uh, I can't think of a more fitting place to hold the program. So thanks to the Parks, Recreation, Community Services program for, for hosting us here today. Um, the Library Commission came up with the idea for One City, One Story 21, 20 years ago. And it's a, this, we're, which we're celebrating the anniversary of today. And I'd like to um, uh, acknowledge the members of this year's Library Commission who continue to support this endeavor. Our chair, Michael Stammer, who's here today, and the other commissioners, Adrian Bass, Judith Blanton, Chelsea Dickerson, Jordan Hutkin, Robert Karatsu, Bo Patadian, and Leslie Rosenthal. Thank you to our Library Commission for their support. Their support. And this year's selection committee, the group that that um, finds a finds a collection of really wonderful, outstanding books, re- reads and reviews them all, and does the difficult work of choosing which one we're going to promote through the city. And I'd like to thank those members. Our founding um, founding member of One City, One Story, Jolly Erner, who, who, who passed this year, and also other co- our other founding um, member of One City, One Story Selection Committee, Larry Wilson, our, our founding members. And the other members this year, Sharon Calkin, Rosemary Choate, Sally Kowser, Brooke Larson Garlock, Roberta Martinez, Natalie Park, Michelle Pereira, Susanna Porras, Dr. Aisha Randall, Christine Reeder, Maggie Reyes Rothner, and Mary Schuler. Thank you to all the members of the selection committee this year. And I hope you don't mind. I, I want to give you a couple of updates on the library because it's kind of an important time for us in the library. The Pasadena Public Library serves as an important city institution that continuously delivers on equity to the city of Pasadena, as demonstrated by the fact that three out of four people in the community say that the library provides services and programs for people like them. They recognize that, that they are represented in the library, which is so nice to hear. And high percentages across all age groups, regardless of education level or family status, agree that the Pasadena Public Library is important to them. And close to nine in 10 agree that Pasadena's libraries play a critical role in educating our children here in Pasadena and um, helping them succeed in school and later in life. The Pasadena Public Library was founded before Pasadena became a city. I don't know if you knew that. Residents came together to support the funding of the first library by purchasing shares for as little as $5 a piece. And since its inception over 135 years ago, the Pasadena Public Library has played a valued part in the community with more than 3,000 on-site and in-person programs a year, free access to Wi-Fi, extensive collection of books that are available for free to the community and online um, resources too, 
the Pasadena Public Library serves as a lifelong learning center for the community. Uh, and I say this with knowing that about a year from now, in February in 2023, we will see the expiration of the city's library partial tax. So we've got a little bit less than a year before that happens. The, the history of that, in June of 1993, voters chose to save the Pasadena Public Library by, uh, and the operations of the library by taxing themselves overwhelmingly with support for the library. And 14 years later, in 2007, residents came together once again and voted by an 80.3% margin, overwhelming support, to renew that measure in order to continue the services provided by the Pasadena Library. So, um, if City Council approves this summer, Pasadena will ask voters again if they would like to continue this existing source of revenue by voting on the Pasadena Library Services continuation measure. That will continue to maintain our libraries, keep books on the shelves, retain qualified librarians, support school success, ensure that we have Wi-Fi and computers in all of our libraries for people to use for free. This is not a new tax. It's an extension of an existing revenue source that's been in place for 29 years, which we're really proud of. And extending this current revenue source for another 15 years will allow us to continue these excellent resources for the community. You're gonna hear more about it over the next couple of months between now and November. If you have any questions or concerns about it, again, I'd be happy to, um, happy to answer those. Or if you're a part of any community groups that would like more background on the measure, feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to talk to those groups too. Um, the city maintains its commitment to ensure that Pasadena res residents have the resources that they need. And we wanna keep this resource in place for the community. Um, back to today's program. So Stealing Home, Los Angeles, the Dodgers, and the lives caught in between. It's a story about baseball, about family, and also about the displacement of communities too, which is a theme that here in Pasadena, we've done a really excellent job this year um, honoring some people who lived and worked in a community that was displaced. And I wanna congratulate Council Member Kemeny and the partners that he worked with on a recently opened um, series of monuments in at 10, uh, 100 West um, Colorado that honor the people and communities that worked and lived in, in that area of the, of the, of the city. Um, throughout history, communities of color are, are predominantly in, um, the ones impacted by displacement in situations like the one that we'll hear about today um, in the construction of Dodger Stadium. And I congratulate um, Council Member Kennedy and his partners on that recent accomplishment. I think it's really important in order to create a more just future moving forward that we do honor the people um, who live and work in our communities whose histories have been displaced and in some places forgotten. And that's what we're, I'm excited to hear about today when we hear the story of the construction of, of Dodger Stadium. Um, a little bit about the author. Herrick Nussbaum is a writer and former editor at Vice. His work has appeared in Sports Illustrated, ESPN, the magazine, and um, lost my place, sorry, The Daily Beast, Deadspin, and the Best American Sports Writing Anthology series. He was born and raised in Los Angeles, and he's also lived and worked in Mexico City, New York, and Seattle. He now lives in Tacoma, Washington with his family. Thanks for visit, uh, visiting us down here in Southern California. Uh, before we begin this program, I just have a few, few short housekeeping matters to go over restrooms right out this door and to the right if you're looking for those. Um, copies of the book. If you don't have one already, I think we still have a few um, available copies that we're giving away to keep at the end of this program. And Eric's agreed to sign copies of the book who are over at this table at the end of the program today. Um, you can also check out the book at the library. We've got it in print and in electronic formats. If you'd like to purchase a copy, our local bookstore of Romans has them for sale too. I hope you'll support them. Um, this is our premier program around the book, but throughout June, we'll be having a series of programs that, um, that touch on the themes that we'll be talking about today. And I wanna thank Christine Reeder for the hard work she's done uh, coordinating really some fantastic events. Um, we had um, programs about baseball, about um, civic planning, and uh, we have a really wonderful one coming up about um, Jackie Robinson that's listed in the flyer that I think you've all received here. So check that out to see what programs are coming up. Some of the past ones are also recorded 
and available on the library's YouTube channel if you'd like to see the, those. Um, if you have a question for, the, for Eric, you should have a little sheet with you. You can jot down your question and library staff will come around and, and collect them and we'll have a question and answer at the end of the presentation today. Um, over at the table where Derek is are some additional sheets if, you, if you've got more questions than can fit on your paper. Uh, I think that's all I've got. Thanks for um, your patience while I uh, set the stage. I'm gonna, I'd like to introduce Council Member John J. Kennedy to introduce our author. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's always good to uh, be with extraordinary human beings, and I know that all of you are, because you wouldn't be here today for such a subject. Earlier, I think I saw my seatmate for approximately nine years, Margaret McAustin, council, former councilman, uh, former vice mayor, Margaret McAustin. Please stand so they can see you. Also, a Blair High School graduate, Rick Cole is not the only one in the audience who graduated from Blair High School. Ah, Julie Gutierrez, our former assistant city manager, Julie, would you stand just for a moment? Thank you. 2022 marks the 20th anniversary of our community reading program, One City, One Story. This annual program was created to promote the importance of reading by recommending a compelling book that links the community together in a common conversation. It has done just that each year, sparking lively community discussions and open dialogue on the significant issues raised by the selected book. This year's choice, Stealing Home, is being celebrated with an array of programming opportunities planned around the theme of the book. This afternoon's conversation with author Eric Nussbaum kicks off a month-long series of book discussions, events, and films offered by the Pasadena Public Library. Before I introduce our illustrious author, I would like to put in a plug that I co-chair the original task force for library funding, alternate funding, along with Ross Selvage. And so it's good to know that the voters of Pasadena have repeatedly renewed that tax, and we need it more now than ever. Some of you have billionaire friends who live in Pasadena. <laughs> Think of the Central Library as our Notre Dame. When Notre Dame burned, what happened? The Arnault family, LVMH, Moet, and all those other names stepped up almost $1 billion to rebuild Notre Dame. We must undergird, if necessary, rebuild our central library because it's central to the core of who we are as Pasadenans. So don't shirk from the responsibility that I have just given you. We are glad that you are here to enjoy today's presentation. And now it is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce an extraordinary human being, 
Pasadena 2022, one city, one story, author Eric Nussbaum. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? All right. Thank you for that introduction. I appreciate it. I'll try to be extraordinary for you right now. Uh, first of all, thank you all for having me. Thank you to the Pasadena Public Library. Uh, this is a very special day for me because although Stealing Home was published in March of 2020, this is my first in-person public book event. So it feels like it's being published today. It's also special because it's back in LA, Pasadena, and you know uh, we're in Jackie Robinson's backyard and Mac Robinson's backyard. Um, and in the time between writing the book and publishing it, I moved to Pacific Northwest. So coming home to talk about the book feels real special. I'm really happy to be here to do that. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the story of the book and also try to walk through some of my research process, some of my writing process and practices and how it all came together. Um, in 2003, when I was, I think it was 2003, I was a junior in high school, a man named Frank Wilkinson came and spoke to my US history class. And he was there to talk about the Red Scare and being blacklisted in the 1950s in LA. Um, but the first thing he asked us, and he was, you know, pretty old gentleman at that point, I think around 90. He had white hair and a sort of distinct bearing. And he, in this gravelly voice, said, you know, who here is a baseball fan or Dodger fan? And I was very much a Dodger fan. And I raised my hand, shot it up. And he said, well, Dodger Stadium should not exist. And I thought, what? <laughs> what is this guy talking about? Um, but he began to tell a story about why he thought Dodger Stadium should not exist, and I was captivated by it. I was completely, like, just taken, um, compelled, and it just held on to me, and it held on to me for such a long time that I wrote a book about it. Um, it's a book, really, about why Dodger Stadium does exist, and it's a book that tells three kind of interweaving stories that, that lead to the construction of the stadium. Um, the first is a story of a family called the Adechiga family who came to Los Angeles around 1919, 1920 uh, from really uh, Zacatecas, from Mexico by way of Arizona. And then it's a story of Frank Wilkinson himself who was a public housing official in LA. And it's a story about the city and about baseball and about boosterism. and kind of the world we create because it's the world we really want to live in and the choices we make as a society. Um, so I guess I'll kind of run through the story of the book a little bit. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know who here has read it and who here hasn't, so we're going not to go, not go too crazy into detail, but I, I won't give all the spoilers away, but you know, you know that Dodger Stadium was built. Um, so... The book really centers on, on this community of Palo Verde, which is what we now think of as Chavez Ravine. Um, Chavez Ravine being sort of the name we give to the area around Dodger Stadium, but there isn't really like a set geographic boundary to it. In the book, I write that it's sort of a state of mind more than a physical place. Uh, the physical place that we have now as Dodger Stadium doesn't resemble what was there before at all. Uh, there were three communities there called Palo Verde, La Loma, and Bishop. And they were largely Mexican-American communities um, built in part because of racially restrictive covenants and redlining laws that existed in the United States um, in the first half of the 20th century and continue to affect the way you know our cities grow and develop now. The Arechiga family came to LA and they bought a plot of land in Palo Verde on Malvina Avenue, uh, right next to where the police academy is now in LA. And they built a house by hand, living in tents. And Abrana and her husband Manuel raised a family there. And 
generations went by and their community grew and grew. Um, it was never a super wealthy community, but it wasn't a poor community either. It was just a neighborhood with, you know, nice houses and some not nice houses with a church and a school. And they had a hard time getting resources from the city. You know, you would see articles about community banding together to get bus service because they couldn't get bus service or, um, you know, getting into arguments with neighboring communities about who went to what school. The community um, sent a lot of a lot of young men off to World War II, and they lost a lot of young men. In that's sort of the that's the baseline we'll we'll give for for Palo Verde. Um, the other thing to say is that it was a little bit off the grid. So, like right now, if you want to go to a Dodger game, you take the freeway. There was no freeways then, and getting in and out of the communities were, was tricky. They were in these hillsides. They were rocky. It wasn't. It wasn't like driving into a residential neighborhood in Pasadena or in Culver City where I grew up. Um, so people kind of thought of these communities as isolated, if they thought of them at all, to be totally honest, because they weren't really on the, on the map. Um, so we're going we're gonna to fast forward to, to World War II. And in World War II in LA, uh, the city had a pretty major crisis that might sound familiar, where there wasn't enough housing for all the people who wanted to live here. Um, in particular, we had a lot of military families. We had a lot of people coming to work in the war industry. And the solutions proposed for housing were pretty varied. But one of them, um, and one that had a lot of success during the war, was public housing facilities. Um, we built a lot of public housing during World War II to house military families. And a lot of the housing projects we still have in LA come from, from that time. Um, Frank Wilkinson, the man who came to my high school class, grew up in Beverly Hills. And he went to UCLA in the early 30s. And he came from a deeply religious Methodist family, like deeply religious. He wasn't allowed to dance, wasn't allowed to play cards as a kid. He, um, and he was that way all through college. And then after college, he decided he wanted to become a minister, but first he would take a trip to the Holy Land and see the world. But on that trip, he encountered something for the first time in his life, and that was poverty. He had never seen it, even though he had grown up in a huge city full of plenty of, you know, impoverished areas. He was so sheltered that he had to go all the way to, you know, Bethlehem to see, to see poverty for the first time really in his life. And he became immediately cynical and lost his faith in this kind of very dramatic moment. Frank was a very dramatic guy. And he he became radicalized, essentially. So when he came back to LA, he did so wanting to change the world, um, wanted to save the world. And the way he decided he could do it was through public housing. So he, he worked initially integrating public housing facilities in LA as an activist, and then became an official in the public housing administration. And he had this vision of creating a public housing project where these three communities of Palo Verde, La Loma, and Bishop stood. And the project was going to be called Elysian Park Heights. And it had a lot of momentum behind it. This was late 40s. Um, the federal government was sort of just kind of getting more ambitious when it came to providing funding for public housing and, it, and backing um, single family mortgages as well. This is kind of when we like kind of codified our current housing rules. Um, so Harry Truman signed a, a law that would have promised funding for 10,000 units of housing in Los Angeles, uh, which wasn't, was not enough, would not have been enough to cover the housing need the city had. But, but Frank ran with it. And the most ambitious project they were going to build was this Elysian Park Heights. And after driving around the city, they decided the best place for it was at the site of Palo Verde, La Loma, and Bishop. So they hired a couple of really famous architects named Richard Neutra and Robert Alexander to design these, these housing projects. And they, they did so with the belief, I should say, that like, I feel like now the term housing project has a very distinct kind of undertone to it. In the 40s, that wasn't really the case yet. These were people who believed that public housing was the future. I mean, the idea that everybody should own a single family home and that should be the source of all their wealth and their family, 
was still not really settled yet in this country. And a lot of people truly believe that we could do things differently and that maybe that's not the best way to go and that you could live in a public housing facility and have a great life and maybe use your money on other things. Um, anyway, at that time, um, they had a very utopian vision for what Elysian Park Heights could be. And part of that was also this belief that you know, really, really good architecture and really good urban planning could lift people out of poverty as if that was enough to do it, which was pretty misguided. Um, so Frank um, and the city of LA and the county of LA essentially went door to door in these communities evicting residents in 1949. And um, residents were forced to sell their homes with eminent domain, um, talking about more than a thousand families here. Uh, some of those residents, you know, were okay with it. Some were not. The communities were not like, you know, no two people or three people agree on one thing, right? Everybody had different opinions about it. Um, the Adechiga family in particular was not a fan of this idea and refused to sell their home. And some of their other neighbors did as well. And it became a very contentious, dramatic sort of issue that, that lingered in LA politics. And as this was happening, the city is also dealing with real estate developers who are against public housing and want to destroy it and see an in. Um, you know, this idea of public housing is a threat. If you're somebody who's a, who sells houses, you want to be able to build your houses and not have the government building houses for cheaper for free. It's not good competition for you. Um, so what happened in LA was that after most families were evicted at Elysian Park Heights, or at what, what would not become Elysian Park Heights, um, Frank Wilkinson was testifying in a hearing related to eminent domain when an attorney asked him essentially if he was a communist. And that question essentially ended his life. It, um, he refused to answer on the grounds that it was not a fair question, not relevant. It's his, you know, First Amendment right to believe whatever he wants to believe. And he, he was immediately fired, or almost immediately fired. His wife, who was a public school teacher, was immediately fired from her job as well. Uh, they were called to testify before all these committees. You know, their children were shunned. It was a, it was a devastating blow for their family. And it was also a devastating blow in a, in a mayoral campaign that was essentially all about housing. Um, so the following year, 1953, LA elected an anti-public housing mayor named Norris Polson. Um, we can get into the details of, of how this all happened. It's a lot of uh, kind of dirty politics and corruption. But Polson canceled the housing project and left most of this land that had once been these three beautiful communities vacant. Um, a few families remained, including the Adechigas, and the city had to figure out what to do with this land that it had acquired and was still in this sort of tenuous legal limbo, and it took years to do it. They talked about putting in a zoo, they talked about a cemetery, they talked about an airport, um, community college. Um, obviously, we know eventually the city used the land to lure the Dodgers west from Brooklyn, and in 1958, that's what happened. Um, but before the Dodgers could build their stadium, they had to deal with the remaining families that were there. Uh, one of those families, the most vocal, the most active of those families was the Arechiga family. And they were, on May 8, 1959, forcibly evicted from their homes on live television in Los Angeles. Um, and that's, that's the climax of the book. And that, that scene is probably the, the one that stuck with me the most while writing it. Um, it's a historical book, but I'm not a historian, at least by trade. I, I didn't major in history. I didn't really have any historical research expertise uh, going into writing it. Uh, I, you know, my job was as a journalist, and I, I had to kind of figure out how to be a historical researcher on the fly. It was a really interesting process for me. It was was how to, how to write a historical book and also how to write a story that covers decades and is this big, messy history without like clean beginnings and endings. Um, at first, I, I kind of like thought it's going to be pretty simple. I'm just going to write it as if I'm writing, you know, 10 long magazine stories in a row. 
and I'm just going to stack them up on top of each other, and I'll have a book. It's not like that. Um, it was an intricate, complex process. You know, like, you see the scenes in movies where, like, the detective has a big board with all the strings pointing from one to another? That was, like, my brain for years while writing this thing. Um, so for the research, I, I started to reach out to friends who I knew who kind of worked in academia or historians. Um, I spent a lot of hours in libraries bothering librarians, so I'm very grateful uh, for all librarians. They're the best. I learned about online resources, and I, and I learned about historical archives and the limits of historical archives. Um, you know, this is a book, so I talked about the Rechiga family and I talked about Frank Wilkinson. Frank Wilkinson left a thousand-page oral history at UCLA. His papers are in the Southern California Library in South Central. Like, you can go see what day he had a hearing aid appointment. But, like, Abrana Arechiga left nothing. You know, she left family history and stories. And how can you tell a story fairly when you have so much information about one person and our society has chosen to value that life and preserve that life and so little about another? So it became about, you know, really talking to people and knocking on doors. Um, that's the part of the book that I'm the most proud of. The part that was the most emotionally satisfying for me was speaking to families and, and getting to hear their stories and being trusted with them because it's a sacred thing when somebody will let you tell them their life story and give you the chance to write it down. It's very vulnerable to, to allow somebody to do that. I know that I get nervous when I'm asked questions about, about anything really. Um, my first interview I remember for the book was this guy named Al Zepeda and he, he came and met me at Elysian Park, which is, you know, right down the street from where he used to live. We sat down at a picnic table and he told me stories about what it was like to grow up there. And he told me about this dog that they would always pass. And every night, uh, it was quiet, but then some nights it would randomly start howling and it became this neighborhood legend that every time the dog howled, that meant somebody died in the community that night. It's like these, these sort of like magical memories that, I don't know, that a place can leave behind. He told me about how hard it was for them when they had to move from, you know, um, Balabeda to I think it was Whittier and be in a place without neighbors they knew. His mom didn't speak English and people looked at him funny because they didn't really want him there and how hard it was to lose, lose his childhood that way. Um, you really want to not mess that up when you're writing a book, it turns out. Uh, that was especially true for the Arechiga family, for Abrana. Abrana was this really feisty, um, really, really smart and woman who didn't take any BS from anybody. And, um, you know, in every, every book about these events, and there's other ones, this is not the only one by any means, in every documentary on the Wikipedia page, you hear about, you know, how and why she was violently evicted from her home. And, the one thing I really hoped to do and tried to do was to, to actually answer, like, why, why them? Like, what made this, this person different? What, why did their life lead them to resist sheriff's officers um, in their house, you know, when their neighbors didn't do that? What, what set them apart? And I don't know if I really answered that question, but I tried. I, I really tried hard. Um, but there's, like, this... I don't know. There's a distance you can never really cross, and I'm sort of winging it here. Um, like, you telling stories, and you're you're interviewing people, and you're you're looking at archives, you know. And there's moments when you feel like you really don't know. You just don't know, and the weight of what you don't know is going to crush you. And there's moments that you see something, and it's like a light bulb goes off, and you feel like you can speak to the person from the grave somehow, centuries later. I remember going in to this skyscraper in downtown LA where the O'Malley family, who used to own the Dodgers, uh, Walter O'Malley's son, Peter, has an office. And they were generous enough, and I couldn't believe it, to let me go through Walter O'Malley's papers. And he has these index cards that he kept um, where he wrote his ideas down for the stadium. So, you know, one idea would be like monorail in the parking lot, which didn't happen, or, you know, he wanted to have retractable roof that could move with the sun so people didn't have to sit in the sun. Um, a milk bar for kids. He had, I mean, the stuff that's in the stadium and the stuff that's not. You can see it all right there. It's, in, it's incredible. Um, <laughs> I remember towards the end of my research, I, um, I'm going to wrap it up here. I had actually finished the first draft of the book, and I had to go back to UCLA to look at one more thing. Um, I was in the Ed Roybal archive. Ed Roybal was a council member in L.A., um, first 
Mexican American council member, and he was the Arechiga's advocate. He was in this funny position because he was an advocate of this family, but he was also very supportive of the Dodgers move west and the Dodgers coming to LA. And um, a lot of the stuff about this starts and ends with Ed Roybal. But you know, I was going through these folders of correspondence that have been preserved from his time there. And I mean, other researchers have, have been through that a million times. You can see it. You can see it in other books. But I was, I was trying to confirm a date, I think, on something. And I see this letter that I had never seen before. And it's probably my third or fourth time going through that folder. And it was a letter from Juan Arechiga, who was Abrana's son, who was one of the people evicted, to um, the mayor of LA, Norris Polson, and the council. And it was just him spilling out his guts about everything that had happened and about how his family had been treated. And I'm going to read a paragraph from it, and then we'll, we'll go to Q&A. Um, my father had a Model T Ford. On that truck, we went to Fresno and picked fruit. We did this for about eight or nine years. It used to take us about a week to get there. So the people themselves can see that my parents made quite a sacrifice to have what they had, two houses and a lot in Chavez Ravine. The first step in taking possession of their land was for a housing project. That was abandoned. So now, does the housing authority have the right to sell our land to the city and they in return sell it to Mr. O'Malley for a private ballpark? I mean, that was it. That was like the whole book right there in one paragraph. And I will, um, I'll end it there. Thank you for listening to me ramble on. Answer some of your questions that you submitted. Library staff's going to walk through the hall too and collect more if you thought of any. Thanks a lot. Um, there we go. And I'm reminded by Christine that we do have available copies of the book left over. So please stay after the program. Join us over here at this table, and Eric will be happy to sign your own copy to keep. It's great. And library staff will come, come through and collect your questions. First question I've got for you, Eric. The beginning of the book really grabs your attention. Why do you start with Abrana as to start the book off? I think Abrana is like the heart and soul of the book. I think her story, her tragedy is the it's the most moving and important part of it. To me, she's she's the main character. You know, she's the she's the protagonist of the book in many ways. Um, I also think that the real climax of the book is the eviction, and for the eviction to be it's probably more speaking like, you know, writing process wise, for the eviction to have emotional resonance, you have to start with, with the person being evicted, essentially. I was really um, taken by um, flipping back and forth between the narrative of Frank Wilkinson and then Abrana and the other people in the community, the Loma, Palo Verde, and Bishop, the contrast, not just between housing, but healthcare. You know the, what you said about medical records. Their experience with the justice system, this, mm -hmm. um, like when uh, Frank Wilkins, uh, Frank's experience with a judge and what happened to him. What was that like for you, discovering the differences between uh, their experiences? It was amazing, as it was like they lived in completely different worlds. Yeah. I mean, Frank Frank was a child of privilege. He had everything. You know, his father was a well-respected doctor and an activist and a well-known person in L.A. Um, and he just, I mean, it was, yeah, it was complete, I mean, it was just two different worlds. Uh, the experience that he had of Los Angeles and the experience that Abrana had, in, also in Arizona, they both lived in Arizona, weirdly, at the same time, uh, was just not even comparable. Not even comparable, yeah. It does. I hope I won't give anything away. There's an experience where he goes before a judge for speeding ticket or parking ticket, I can't remember, and he says, I have, Tickets to the Hollywood Bowl tonight. Can I serve my jail sentence after the concert? And he gets, yeah, and they say yes. <laughs> yeah, incredible. Yeah, so we've got some questions on the audience. Sure. Um, some of the uh, we find that a lot of our audience members are often aspiring writers themselves. So I hope you don't mind me asking a couple of questions no, about your process. I'm writing. still an aspiring writer. Yeah, right. <laughs> Good. So we loved your remarks about you're really in a sacred role telling somebody else's story. Tell us about that. What do you do when you're interviewing them? Do you take notes? Do you record them? What's it? How do you how do you do that part of your job when you're writing a historical research book like this with oral histories? I like to have a recorder if the person's comfortable with it and 
put it down on the table and then not take notes. Uh, I find if I'm writing down notes, then I'm distracted and that I'm not making eye contact and I'm not really listening. Um, my main, I guess I have a couple of personal philosophies about this. I'm not, you know, the greatest interviewer in the world or anything, but I don't like to ask too many questions. I don't like to talk too much. Um, I like to let people talk and have a conversation and just sort of, I have a few things in my head that I want to hear, but I don't, I don't like to ask too many pointed questions. Um, I'm not trying to gotcha somebody usually, especially when I'm doing something like this. Um, I just want to hear people's stories and have them comfortable and have them talk and let them feel like, like they can say what they need to say. Thanks. Obviously, we're very successful doing that because the stories that come out in the book are just amazing. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Um, here's one from the question. How do you feel going to Dodger Stadium now after what you've learned by writing this book? Well, I haven't been to Dodger Stadium much lately, um, but I, it's a powerful experience. You know, I, first of all, I still love going to Dodger Stadium. And I think I might love it more in a sense because I appreciate so much of what happened to, to make that place exist. And I didn't talk about it just now, but the work that the O'Malley family did, um, that Walter O'Malley did to build that place was so specific and he was such a kind of insane power hungry genius that it was, it was, I mean, it's a beautiful, important building and so much thought went into it. I mean, the, the way that, you know, they grew the grass at the exact same elevation where the grass would be. So they knew that it would, it would thrive in the right environment. I mean, it was really, really precise detail. Um, so I appreciate the architecture and I appreciate the place. But I also appreciate the gravity of it. And when you've sat with somebody and they can tell you where their house used to be, and you can look out in the parking lot and see center field, and there was a school buried underneath the parking lot there, like an entire school buried out there, it makes you think differently about it, absolutely. Do you think the Dodgers or the city can do anything to, to share the legacy that you tell in your book? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, they, they could do. I mean, first of all, they could do anything. because Nobody's done anything, really. Uh, the Dodgers have not, the city, the county. I think they have a responsibility to do, to do a lot. Uh, that all said, I'm not the person who should be deciding what they should and shouldn't be doing. The, there's community organizations. There's one called Buried Under the Blue that was started by some descendants of, of the Adeshiga family. Uh, people like that, people who live there, should be having those conversations. They are having them, or they're trying to have them, uh, but it's not my responsibility. Like I'm not, it's not like I'm, not, I'm not shirking the responsibility, but I, I think it's yeah. important that people who are deeply connected yeah. to it do it. Good answer. Uh, this is a technical question about the architecture of Dodger Stadium. Oh, why, <laughs> why does Dodger Stadium not face downtown? I think it's because of the sun. I think it's because they don't want to have the batters facing the sun. I think yeah. it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty much about that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. I saved that one. Um, do you have a favorite line in your book? No. Uh, probably some line that I had to get deleted at some point. <laughs> Usually the ones that you like the most are the ones you have to cut. Uh, that was good. Uh, I think you, you talked about this in your talk, but maybe you want to share more. What inspired you to write about the Mexican communities near Dodger Stadium? Um, it was just what's what the story was, you know. I, I think I said earlier that I came to it more from a journalistic perspective than a historian perspective, and it's kind of a, a storytelling wise. Those communities are the story. I mean, they're their destruction is the is the great tragedy in this. I mean, Frank Wilkinson's personal destruction is a tragedy, but he was also the engineer of the destruction of those communities. So, um, it's you know. If, if your community was eminent domain and taken away from you on the pretense of bettering the community and bettering the city as a whole, and then instead of bettering the city as a whole, the government decided to sell your neighborhood to a wealthy real estate owner in New York who wanted to bring his business to California, it would be a tragedy if that happened now. I mean, it would be infuriating. And I think this simple injustice of that kind of speaks for itself. How have the families that you interviewed received the book? 
You've talked to them since. Probably. Yeah, I think pretty well um, for the most part. The people who talk to me still have received it well. Uh, you know, the only real negative feedback I got was from a couple people who didn't speak with me, who I'd asked to speak with and said no. And you know, a lot of these are family stories, so there's always mm -hmm. more than one side to a family story. And so if I told a story and then you know the other cousin said no, no, it wasn't like this, it was like that, uh, but I didn't speak to the other cousin, so I didn't get that mm -hmm. side of it. Uh, a couple of those situations, but the people have been really positive, and I'm appreciative. Um, someone asked, do you think the O'Malley's have been um, unfairly chastised? I don't think they've really been chastised that much. Um, okay. um, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't really think the O'Malley's have been chastised. Um, I, I think that I think that people do. I, let me let me rephrase that. First of all, no, not really. But second of all, I think there's a misunderstanding of this story that's really broad, which is that it, it gets condensed. It becomes there was a community there, and the Dodgers came and kicked them out and built the stadium. But that's not what happened. And people who might chastise Walter O'Malley might do so under the false impression that he came in from Brooklyn with the explicit intent to evict a thousand families from their homes. I don't believe that's what happened. I believe that the city did this to itself, essentially. And Walter O'Malley benefited from it, and he did so without any you know, remorse, I don't think. And he might have pushed things along a little bit, but, but this is much bigger than just the Dodgers. Two more questions. Then. I think we'll wrap it up. Um, one is, uh, I'm a librarian, so I've got to ask you a little bit more about libraries. You said that it was a big part of writing your book for you. Why are libraries important to you? Well, I mean, library is important to me as a reader. Uh, I'm a person who loves books and reads books, and you know, I spent many days walking. My mom's here and dad, they can attest to the Julian Dixon Library of the LA County System in Culver City, and checking out books for myself. Uh, I love books and love libraries. Um, I still, you know, now live in Tacoma. I check out books there all the time. Audiobooks are a thing I just got into, and you can get free audiobooks at the library too. Uh, but aside from that, you know, libraries are not just books. They're places where you can really like learn about about the world in a way that goes beyond just like pick up a book and read it. It's the amount of archival material, the amount of thoughtful curation that goes into stuff. Um, librarians do a lot more than just, you know, catalog and shelf books and help people find a recommendation. It's, uh, it was eye-opening, honestly, to write a, a book like this and have to really rely on library resources and, and archives um, and just learn how extensive it is. Last question I wanted to ask uh, has to do with the namesake of our building, the Robinson family and Jackie Robinson in particular, very important. Pasadena history, Los Angeles history too. You have a really fascinating section of the book about uh, Jackie's testimony, the House on American Activities Committee, and, and other facts throughout the book, too. Is there anything interesting that you learned in doing your research of Jackie Robinson that you'd like to share with the audience? Or, uh, yeah, anything? yeah. I mean, first of all, I think Jackie Robinson, this is going to sound crazy, I think Jackie Robinson is underappreciated um, as a human being beyond, you know, being the first ball player to break the color barrier. I mean, like, you know, Larry Doby played for Cleveland like a month later. It was, it was in the American League, but nobody talks about him. And it's not just because Jackie Robinson was first, and it's not just because Jackie Robinson had a better career, but it's because Jackie Robinson was a serious like, intellectual guy, and he was an activist, and he was thoughtful, and he was, he was engaging with big ideas and with big problems in our society throughout his whole life. You know? He was called to testify uh, in front of HUAC in 1949, which is his best season, his first all-star season, um, to testify against Paul Robeson, who was an entertainer who had been condemned for being a communist and you know playing concerts in the Soviet Union. And it was basically like this hatchet job against Robeson. But Jackie Robinson, being kind of vulnerable, didn't really have a choice. He was called to testify against Robeson. Uh, his boss, Branch Rickey, was a fierce anti-communist. And essentially, the threat was that if you don't throw Robeson under the bus, we're going to call you out of the communist, right? This was a time when anybody could be a commie and have their life ruined. And Jackie Robinson's life was really vulnerable at that time. And Robinson went up there, and he basically said, 
we're wasting your t- our time. And he gave this incredible speech. Um, I printed some of it in the book, but about what really matters and oppression in America and the courage it took to do that um, in 1949 in his position is it's amazing. It's a really wonderful, nuanced part of the book. I think, and I, I thank you for that. And to be all, thank you for being here today too. If you haven't re- read the book, you're really going to enjoy it. You've got remember to pick up a copy here today. There goes our video. Thank you for uh, helping us celebrate our 20th year of One City One Story. We're really glad to, to have lured you down from Tacoma to visit us. Oh no, thank you. On a hot afternoon here in Pasadena, and uh, really wonderful to have you here. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it.